<laughs> Hello my lovelies and welcome to this penultimate episode of the Dark Tower Retrospectives and indeed a look at the penultimate book in the series, The Song of Susanna. Now, like Wolves of the Cala, this one has a particular resonance for me because these books were coming out sort of annually while I was at university, so I would... On my way to university, I would pop into local bookstores to see if the next one was out. I mean, this was this was in the days when I this is going to sound very strange, but there's a certain strange cultural resonance here because this was it was early 2000s. So it was in the days when the Internet was really in its infancy or at least its adolescence. It was not as much an ubiquitous platform or sphere of operation as it was as it has become. It um, it was still very much alien territory. There was a notion of it being a new frontier. So I wasn't really online that much back in those days. I, I still went to bookstores to um, have a, you know, a nose around and just to look at the shelves and whatnot and see what was knocking about. And Derby, which is where I went to university, was a good place to do that. It was a good place to do that because there were, it's, it was a student catered town. Um, it had lots of bookstores. It had lots of stuff that you, lots of places where you could just wander around and just lose yourself. I found so many beautiful books as a result of that. Um, but from Wolves of the Cala onwards, I was checking in to see if the new big, shiny hardback editions of the Dark Tower books were in. And very, sometimes, I, I must admit, when I saw them in, I would go and buy the book, not go to university, go back home and read them in one sitting. And that's, uh, I think, that certainly happened with Walls of the Cala, and that certainly happened with this book. Um, Song of Susanna is the penultimate book in the series. It is often one that people... It's very ambiguous, like Wolves of the Cala, like pretty much every book in this series for, sit from Wizard and Glass onward. It divides the crowd. There are people who really like it. There are people who really don't. It is probably the most transitional of all the transitional books in this series because it's a it's a passing through book. This book is setting up the ending. Um, it's not only setting up the ending, it's tying up a lot of the plot threads that have been established in the previous book. So it, it picks up directly after Walls of the Cala, after the Battle of the Cala, where Roland and Eddie and uh, Jacob helped the people of the Cala to fend off the robots from the, uh, the mountains. And they find there is a gateway. There is a sort of semi-technological, semi-mystical gateway hidden within the facility where the robots come from. And the gateway leads to another world. It leads to another reality they've encountered them before they've encountered these things before these this is how they transition from one reality to the next um on their way on their path across the beam which leads to the dark tower and as they pass through the team become divided they both end up in different time zones and different variations of the earth that we come from so the the, the literal world that we come from uh, Susanna ends up in New York in 1999 not a good place to be and Jacob Roland and Eddie end up somewhere else and as a result you get these two divergent storylines that are going on most of the action in this book takes place in our world it takes place in the real world it's not in some fantasy setting which lends it a certain element a certain air which is kind of fun on Susanna Susanna's side, you get the story of Susanna and the new personality that's possessing her, a creature called Maya, which we learn is actually, um, it's a demon that from, uh, I think it's from the wastelands, it's a demon from a circle of stones that Susanna had to distract while Roland enacted some ritual to open the door that would draw Jacob into Roland's world. And she did so... Um, 
it was such a weird thing. The demon was kind of an incubus, so she she trapped it as she as as you would an incubus. She basically had sex with it, and it's the demon's baby that is swelling inside of her. But it's also the demon itself. Its personality has seeped into her, and it's inverted somehow. It's become rather than being this rampaging male thing, uh, this sort of icon of dark masculinity it's become female it's become a mother it's become maya and maya is carrying the child it's not just the child of the demon it's actually bizarrely the child of the demon of roland and of because roland actually had sex with the demon in an earlier story believe it or not when it was in a female aspect I, you know, whatever. Um, and also the Crimson King, the arch saint of all that is dark and unholy and destructive in this mythology. And the child, it's basically an Antichrist story. It's basically an Antichrist story. The child that is swelling is the dark cousin of Roland, and it is the child that is set to be the prince of all ruin, the, the Antichrist, the one that will bring down the tower essentially. Um, but it's premature. The prophecy isn't working out as it should. And as a result, there are loads of agents that converge on Maya and on Susanna and drag her away to some hellish sort of antenatal ward where they they work on her, basically. They try to... Um, they try to induce the pregnancy and to make sure that the creature, the child, comes into the world as it should, you know? Um, during that process, Maya and Susanna are bizarrely separated. They they become separate entities, which is really bizarre, really strange, and they end up talking to one another. It's kind of fun. There's a lot of really out there abstruse weirdness in it, which is really fun. Um, it's actually the, the stronger side of this story, I think, personally. On the other side, with Roland, Jacob, and Eddie, you get the conclusion of the story that was set up in Walls of the Caller, where they had to save the Rose in the abandoned in the uh, in the abandoned lot, which is actually the influence of the Tower in this world. And they have another, bizarrely, they have another encounter with a character who has already been killed by Roland and Eddie once, Enrico Salazar, who is sort of a crime boss who Eddie is, uh, when Eddie is a drug addict, he is acting as a drug mule for him in uh, The Drawing of Three, and Roland ends up saving Eddie from Salazar. But in this particular time period, he's still alive. So they end up encountering him again it's almost like enrico salazar is uh, sort of like a, an unwitting agent of the crimson king and of ruin and whatnot and that's kind of fun so they end up that that story arc is concluded there they end up actually saving the rose and the vacant lot and whatnot but the real the really significant part of their story is the part that tends to it's it's the part that tends to determine whether people like this story or not because, of course, this is the real... It's this world. It's this reality. So, who exists in this reality? Stephen King exists in this reality. And he is telling and writing the story as it's happening. And they end up... I can't remember how, but they end up learning this. They end up learning that Stephen King exists. And they end up going to see him. Which is really bizarre. Now, usually, I would say, in series where this happens, where you get characters realising that they are, it, to some degree, fictional. It's not that clear in this one. It's not that clear. In this mythology, they're simultaneously fictional and not. It's not that King is God, because Roland asks him that. He actually asks, are you Gan? Are you God? And King says, no, uh, no, he isn't. He's just a... He's just a guy, you know. It's just stories in this reality. It's almost like he, he sets himself up as like a reflector, like a vessel for the stories that are echoing through from other worlds, you know. Um, it's not that he's God. It's not that he created Roland and everything that's going on. It's that in this reality, King is basically telling the story of them. It's just a story here. Um and usually what happens, it's usually a sign of a failing series for me. When you get this happening, it's when the writer has run out of ideas. But actually, within the mythology of the Dark Tower, this actually works because it is a multiverse where all potential realities occur. So it makes sense that there's a reality that is this reality where Stephen King exists and where he's writing the story of the Dark Tower. And I will say this, he doesn't set himself up as God. In fact, it's a really... 
it's King working out a, a bit of shit, I think, through his stories, because the, the portrait of himself that he paints is one who's younger, who's working on the Dark Tower story still. And it's not very flattering at all. It's the Stephen King who still drinks. It's the Stephen King who's kind of neglecting his family a little bit and his work, who is a little bit... Um, Who's, he, he describes himself as lazy. He describes himself as um, as someone who Roland doesn't actually like very much. Roland does not like Stephen King. And the reaction that Stephen King actually has to the uh, the emergence of Roland and Jake and, um, and Eddie is actually really funny. He basically runs away, vomits and faints and can't really... Roland has to hypnotise him because he can't calm him down, you know. I mean, how would you feel? How would you feel if you just saw characters you thought you'd created just turning up in your back garden at some point, you know? Um, it's a sticking point for a lot of people this one it's a sticking point but for me it does make sense within the context of the story it definitely makes sense um and it gets even less flattering in the next book i can tell you because he does turn up again at a particular point um the story is kind as i said it's kind of transitional it is not a complete story by any means it starts directly where wolves of the color ends there's no preamble there's nothing it just hurls you in you can't come into this story not having read the others um if you come into it not having read the ones before you'll have no idea what's happening i'd also advise reading all of the ancillary material for the dark tower as well get a hold of all of the short stories that relate to the dark tower because you're going to need them in this one you're going to need them to understand what's happening it's very fast paced like a lot of the books it's very well written you know it, it just hurtles along at a very punchy pace and again it doesn't really end it leaves you on a massive cliffhanger where I think what happens at the end is you've got Eddie and Roland uh, uh, ready to enter the tower. It, the, not the tower, not the dark tower, but the um, not the uh, not the dark tower, but a tower that reflects and resembles it, which is where Susanna and Maya are about to give birth. So it's a dark, you know, it's dark. It really is a dark story. You also get a couple of deaths in this story, the tying up of certain loose ends that are really kind of sad and very unpleasant, but make sense. This is the one that sets it all up. This is the one where it's going to all come crashing down in the next book, you know? And it's kind of sad. It is kind of sad to think that. But, um, yeah, it's it's not the strongest in the series by any measure. It is definitely a... There's a feeling of having to get things done in this book. And almost... not. I would, I, you know, I think it's belittling it to say that it's workmanlike. It's not. There's some great imagery. There's some very florid stuff happening here. There's some great additions to the metaphysics happening. But at the same time, it is a transitional book. It is trying to bridge the gap between Wolves of the Kala and the final book, which is just called The Dark Tower. Um, it's the setup book. And in that regard, your mileage may in fact vary on this one. <laughs>